Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. For those here in-house, we would ask that courtesy to check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off as we prepare to begin. For those watching online, we remind you that you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And of course, we will post today's program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference as well. Leading our discussion is Hans von Spakowski. He is our senior legal fellow in the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He also manages our election law reform initiative. He is an authority on a wide range of issues, including civil rights, civil justice, the First Amendment, immigration, and the rule of law. He has worked on campaign finance, voter fraud, and voting rights laws as well. Along with John Fund, he co-authored Who's Counting? How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk. And he also has authored Obama's Enforcer, Eric Holder's Justice Department. He served as a member of the Federal Election Commission for two years and has also served on electoral commissions at the state and local level. He was also an assistant attorney general for civil rights at the U.S. Department of Justice as well as a former litigator. Please join me in welcoming Hans von Spakovsky. Hans. Thank you, John. Although you did give me a promotion, I was actually not the Assistant Attorney General. I was, I was a counsel to the Assistant Attorney General, which meant I, which is a good thing because that meant I didn't have to go through a confirmation hearing. Um, well, welcome, welcome, right. Well, welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, we're here to talk about the all out assault on the First Amendment that seems to be going on uh, across the country in the courts, in the public arena, and in legislatures also. Uh, safe spaces, trigger warnings, microaggression, speech codes on campus that restrict the free exchange of opinions and ideas, which I thought was supposed to be what actually happens uh, at universities, uh, because they might offend someone or because they don't meet the current culturally or politically uh, view of what is acceptable. Uh, criminal investigations by state attorneys general urged on by members of uh, the United States Senate and the House of Representatives of those who have dissenting opinions about an unproven scientific theory about catastrophic man-made global warming. In other words, the criminalizing of scientific dissent. Uh, an all-powerful federal agency, rightly feared by all Americans, the IRS, that targeted for increased and unjustified scrutiny nonprofit membership organizations and associations, which, by the way, Alex de Tocqueville a long time ago said uh, were part of the heart of being uh, 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 an American and how Americans participate in their democracy, because of those organizations' disfavored views on the Constitution, our culture, and public policy, by the way, also urged on by members of Congress. Um, and for the first time in our history, I just realized it was almost exactly two years ago, uh, there was a vote in the United States Senate over an amendment to amend the First Amendment, which I think is the first time in our history that an amendment came up uh, to pull back part of the core of the Bill of Rights uh, that was voted in favor of by every single member of one of our political parties and which would have suppressed, given Congress the ability to suppress certain kinds of political speech. Uh, we are facing an all-out assault on the First Amendment that I think is unprecedented uh, in American history. So what we're here to talk about today is, is what is happening to the American ethos. Uh, how serious is it? Who's winning? are we really in danger of losing one of our most constitutional and one of our most precious liberties and rights? And to talk about it, uh, we've gathered four of the leading experts on the First Amendment and all these issues in the country. And I'm going to give a quick introduction to all of them and then let them uh, go forth to talk about this. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Cleta Mitchell, who is a partner at Foley and Lardner, a very prominent Washington law firm. Uh, she has more than 40 years of experience in law, politics, and public policy, 
which I think, Cleta, means that you got your law degree when you were probably 16, right? <laughs> Um, she advises nonprofits and issue organizations, corporations, and candidates on campaign finance, election, and lobbying issues. Uh, she's a frequent author on the First Amendment. She's testified numerous times before Congress. In fact, we have testified together uh, before the same committee, and she's recogni re regularly recognized as one of the leading and most expert lawyers on election issues uh, in the country. She got her BA and JD from the University of Oklahoma. And as I have said uh, more than once, if you are in a fight with an abusive, arrogant government agency and you need a tenacious, no-holds-barred lawyer who will fight for you, who are you going to call? Cleta Mitchell. <laughs> uh, next, we're going to hear from Robert Alt, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Buckeye Institute, where he's been since uh, 2012. Uh, he's also a nationally recognized scholar on constitutional issues as well as a host of other legal areas. Uh, he's been published everywhere from the Wall Street Journal to National Review. And in fact, uh, he spent five months as a war correspondent in Iraq in 2004 where he was embedded with a combat unit. Uh, he sits on the board of numerous organizations, has also testified multiple times before Congress, and taught at both Ashland University and Case Western. He got his JD from the University of Chicago, where I think one of the courses he took on constitutional law was taught by the uh, president, uh, current resident at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, and he got his BA from uh, Azusa Pacific University, where he, and he also clerked for Alice Batchelder of the Sixth Circuit. Now, the only bad thing I can think of to say about Robert Alt is that uh, he left the legal center at Heritage to go over to the Buckeye Institute. So that was uh, their gain and our loss. Uh, next, we're going to hear from John Eastman, who is the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law at the Chapman University Fowler School of Law, where he also served as the dean of the law school for three years. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute and director of the Institute's Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence, which files a lot of amicus briefs uh, before the Supreme Court. Uh, he was a law clerk for Justice Clarence Thomas and for Judge Michael Ludig of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. He practiced with the national law firm of Kirkland and Ellis and earned his JD from the University of Chicago and a PhD and MA from Claremont. He has a BA from the University of Dallas and has written numerous articles and studies on constitutional issues. Uh, finally, uh, we're going to hear from Christina Hoff Summers, who is a resident scholar at one of our sister organizations uh, here in town, the American Enterprise Institute, uh, where she studies the politics of gender and feminism, as well as free expression, due process, and the preservation of liberty in the academy, which these days is an uphill job. And I think of all the people on the panel, including me, uh, you probably uh, hold the record of having the most people protest when you have spoken at universities or around the country, which, which is a badge of honor. Um, she's a former philosophy professor at Clark University and the author of numerous books, including The War Against Boys, which was named a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. She's also the author of numerous other publications, makes frequent uh, radio and TV appearances, and in including hosting her own video blog called the Factual Feminist. Uh, she received her PhD from Brandeis and a BA from New York University. So Cleta, I think we're going to start with you. Well, thank you all. Is it on? Thank you very much, uh, Hans, for hosting this. I think this is a really crucial and important. I think it's on. It says, it says it's on. Is it on? Yes. Now can you hear? Yes. All right. Well, um, This is better. This is better. I think that's just not working. Um, thank you, John. The IRS is in charge. <laughs> uh, that's probably true. More true than you know. Um, thank you very much, Hans, for hosting this and organizing this. And thanks to all of you for coming and everyone who's tuning in from wherever you may be. I apologize in advance. I've got a bit of a cold. And so if I'm sniffling, my, my apologies. Um, Let's start with what George Will calls the five most beautiful words in the English language. The first five words of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law. <laughs> now, what the left has done and is doing is turning that on its head to the point that the First Amendment 
is supposed to be used to protect the government from the people. Certainly not what the Founding Fathers had in mind when they wrote, Congress shall make no law. Now, why should Congress make no law? Restricting or abridging the, the rights of the people to peaceably assemble and to engage in free speech, et cetera, et cetera. Because the government is comprised of people, and people have views, and people are partisan, and people are prejudiced. We have our biases. Just because someone enters the government doesn't make them suddenly lose all of their prejudices and biases. So I'm going to run through some examples of why what is happening today is absolutely so threatening to the future of the First Amendment and our rights as a people to speak and be heard. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the gory details of the IRS scandal. If you want those, you need to buy Kim Strassel's book, The Intimidation Game, How the Left is Silencing Free Speech in America. How many of you have read that book? If you haven't, get it, read it. it, get, it she does a wonderful job of exposing and detailing what has happened, what happened with the IRS. But I want to I say something about why did the IRS get in this business in the first place? Where did that come from? It began with people, these organizations on the left, of which there are dozens and dozens whose sole job in life, they get money from donors, and all they do is spend their every waking hour trying to figure out how to shut up and silence their political opponents. And they began in... Uh, we have a structure with the Federal Election Commission, which is the traffic cop for free speech on, in federal elections. That's what it is. Um, you know, Congress shall make no law. It turns out Congress has made quite a lot of law restricting the free speech rights. So you have the FEC, but it is comprised of no more than uh, three members of the same political party. So that you have a check and balance. If you're going to have one of these things, that's probably a pretty good idea although you need to make sure that the people on it are really partisan rather than having Republicans who always vote with the Democrats, which is usually what happens in these things. But um, that's why Hans was one of my heroes, because he actually protected the Constitution when he was a member of the Federal Election Commission, which is why John McCain would never let him be confirmed. But, um, <clears throat> but when they can't get their way at the FEC, which the left was used to doing for decades, until the likes of Hans von Spakovsky, Brad Smith, and uh, then Don McGahn, and now uh, before they were on the FEC, there was always one Demo Republican who'd vote with the Democrats and give them whatever they wanted. So the left just ran roughshod over the free speech rights of American people. And so when that began to happen, where they began to be deadlocked, and the, and the people who cared about the Constitution and the First Amendment free speech rights began to say, well, we do, I actually don't think that that's, that's right to just constantly be telling people they can't say this, they can't say that, they can't spin this, they can't spin that. So then the left started taking complaints to the IRS and filing. And I had a lot of clients who had uh, things filed against them where the, these leftist groups were demanding that the IRS come in and shut down whatever my client was doing. And over time, once Obama was elected, they began to think, well, that's not such a bad idea. And we have a person in the person of Lois Lerner. And we now know what she thought of conservatives. Let me tell you about another person at the IRS. You may not be aware of this, but there's a person at the IRS who was a maxed out donor to Hillary Clinton starting in 1999 through 2008 and supported her in the presidential campaign, the maximum, and then when she didn't get the nomination, supported Obama to the maximum in both 2008 and 2012, maximum donor. And guess what this person's job is at the IRS? He's the IRS commissioner, <laughs> John Koskinen, for decades, given over $65,000 only to Democrats, not a nickel to a Republican. Do you think that George W. Bush or any Republican president could ever have gotten away with appointing a partisan, maxed out donor, and we wonder why there's been no accountability with the IRS? There are people with biases who are in these agencies. I point to you the John Doe proceedings in Wisconsin, where they literally used the courts and the state police to go in and raid the homes in the early wee hours 
to confiscate computers of political consultants, to try to back into proving that somehow there had been coordination between the Scott Walker recall campaign and, the, uh, and independent groups who disagreed with the recall. I point to you to Montana. Montana, the head of the Montana agency that enforces the speech code in speech laws in Montana, just one person, John Model. John Model was, before he became the speech czar in Montana, the head of Montana Common Cause. When the governor in 2013, the Democratic governor, appointed him to be the head of this agency, there is no 3-3 three, three partisan divide there. It's one guy. When he was appointed, a state senator was publicly quoted as saying, a Republican state senator, we have, pro we have some concerns that he will be fair to Republicans because of his pattern and history of supporting Democrats and supporting things that some of us don't believe in. That state senator's name was Art Wittick. One year later, John Model, as the head of this agency, took a complaint that had been filed by a, sit a candidate in 2010 against her opponent and then amended that complaint to broaden it to include four Republican senators, including Art Wittick. And unfortunately, Art Wittick did not um, engage people immediately as the people in Wisconsin did and had a show trial and a sham trial. And John Model was the complainant. He investigated the complaint. He was the expert witness. <laughs> and the remedy that he sought was to remove Art Wittick from office. The only problem being, Art Wittick no longer held the office from which he was ultimately removed. It was a mess of a trial, a complete miscarriage of justice. But John Model. John Doe proceedings, you in the uh, Lois Lerner, John Koskinen, and then you have the 13 attorneys general who have publicly come out and said they are going to prosecute criminally those of us who don't believe that Tom Steyer ought to dictate what I think about global warming. I mean, the thing is about global warming, I just want to say you guys are the same people who thought Pluto was a planet. <laughs> And you probably are the same people who thought that eggs, eating eggs caused your dietary cholesterol to increase. I mean, you know, science is not static. And they aren't always right. And they've silenced the scientists who disagree with them, and now they want to, si to silence the rest of us. <coughs> this is a huge problem. And I saw something yesterday, and I'll close with this. 43% of millennials agree in a study just done by the Pew Foundation, that the government should be able to restrict speech that is offensive to certain segments of the society. We're in trouble with the First Amendment, and we need to do what we can to protect it. Thank you. So I thought I'd pick up where Cleta left off uh, before you all run for the bar to self-medicate um, uh, and, and talk a little bit more about what's happened with the IRS. Now, a lot of attention was paid to Lois Lerner's uh, uh, efforts to prevent organizations from getting their tax-exempt status. But once you actually got your tax-exempt status, you were fine. You weren't getting harassed by the IRS, right? Not so much. So let me take you back a few years. Um, as Hans mentioned, I left Heritage in, in 2012 to take over the Buckeye Institute. And not long after I got there, Ohio was embroiled over the question about whether or not to uh, expand Medicaid uh, as part of Obamacare. Now, you'll remember the Supreme Court, uh, uh, in, in answering the Obamacare question, they made Medicaid expansion optional for the state, something that Congress didn't anticipate, that the President didn't anticipate. And this was causing quite a bit of anxiety in the Obama administration, because there were states 
oddly enough, that weren't taking the bribe money. They weren't actually expanding Medicaid, and they needed some of the big anchor states to go ahead and do this. So Ohio was a high priority for the Obama administration. Um, and so it should come as no surprise that the Buckeye Institute, uh, the organization I run, which is the, the leading free market think tank in Ohio, led the charge against Obamacare. And I'm pleased to say that temporarily we had a victory. We were able to get it stripped from the budget. Ultimately, uh, the governor went ahead and expanded anyway, and that's a story for a whole other panel. Um, but uh, for a brief shining moment, we, we prevented Medicaid expansion from coming to Ohio. It was around that time that we began to notice some interesting things. Uh, you know, we, like you know, most of the organizations, we take a look and you know, see how much web traffic we're getting, who's visiting our sites and reading and so forth, and you can, you can glean a lot of data from that. Uh, and we began to notice that, gee, um, there's an awful lot of people coming from the IRS uh, domain to visit our sites uh, and, and other government offices. And when I say that, I mean hundreds of visits. Uh, to it. And I'm an optimist. I'm, thi I'm thinking to myself, you know, maybe they're learning something. <laughs> you know, free market ideas, free speech, you know, perhaps, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to be like, you know, the free speech spring. Uh, it, it's coming. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, oddly enough, two months after we, we succeeded in blocking Obamacare's Medicaid expansion, I received a phone call from the Cincinnati office of the IRS informing me that my office had, was going to be subjected to a full field audit. Uh, for those of you who have been told you will never get a phone call from the IRS uh, informing you of an audit, I stand as the exception to the rule um, on that. And, and needless to say, uh, 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 my little tribute to, to Hans uh, and with respect to, uh, to Captain Renault from Casablanca, I was shocked, shocked <laughs> uh, to get this call. So when you get a call like that from the IRS, you treat it seriously. So my next call, apropos Hans's introduction, was to Cleta. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we retained Cleta uh, as our counsel. Um, uh, what followed was about what you would expect in that situation. Uh, the IRS actually planned their, uh, came and visited, did a, a site visit to my office at a time that they knew I was not going to be there uh, in an attempt to gain access, uh, further access to our files. They demanded all of our publications, uh, all of our newsletters, correspondence. They poured over our, our books. We, we went through a full field audit, including uh, uh, questions from the IRS agent, uh, at which point uh, and, and this was, uh, there was a, something of a priceless exchange with my accountant. My accountant I've had for a number of years, he represents a number of folks, but just had not seen anything like this. And in conversations, he kept on asking me questions going into this. I don't understand. I don't understand why it is they're auditing you. There's nothing there. There's no reason for them to do this. And he was just incredulous about this. And so when we sat down, and Cleta can attest to this, he couldn't help himself. The first question out of his mouth was, I've been uh, a CPA in Columbus, Ohio now for over 30 years. I'm a partner at a firm. We have so many partners. I, can, I participate and, and you know, I work with them. I go to continuing CPA education. I know, you know sort of audit practices in central Ohio. Never in 30 years have I ever seen a 501c3 nonprofit subjected to a full field audit. Can you tell me why it is that the IRS is auditing the Buckeye Institute? Uh, the response was, well, uh, you know, I'm new to the case, but I'm sure it was randomly assigned. <laughs> um, never in 30 years random. Uh, however, if it wasn't random, then I can't tell you why it is that we're auditing you, uh, which, of course, is what we expected. But then the next statement, but, of course, really, this is for your own benefit. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, uh, this, this simply will help you with compliance. Um, so uh, at any rate, they found nothing, uh, uh, as you would expect. Everything, uh, uh, everything checked out, and they ultimately had to uh, 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 quietly uh, step back from the action, but not before 
you know, engaging in uh, <coughs> my, my favorite piece of correspondence from them where they were seeking to get me to waive the statute of limitations. The letter came to my office, postage due. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but to say that, that, once again, they're finding nothing had no effect. Let's talk, though, for a moment about the effect it had on its donors and the calls I received from my donors, who were very concerned because they had seen what happened to supporters of Romney. Uh, they had seen them subjected to random audits as well, and they were worried about what might happen in these proceedings. Well, the first thing I told them is uh, our policy with regard to giving donors' names to the IRS above and beyond what we're required to disclose on Schedule B. And the policy which we adhered to during the audit was not one damn name. <laughs> That's what you'll get. Um, but, but notwithstanding that, a number of donors uh, uh, made the logical conclusion that they did not want to end up on any IRS list. And so they began, in, they asked me about means in which they could engage in anonymous donations. Uh, some actually began sending cash. Uh, uh, they asked me not to give them IRS receipts um, because they did not want to take the chance that they were going to become targets because, because of their beliefs and because of their speech. Uh, and that's not the America that we, we, we should be promoting. That's not the America I want to live in. But then came the states. Uh, as actors above and beyond what the IRS had done. So uh, many of you are aware uh, that uh, Kamala Harris, the Attorney General uh, for California, on her own, no legal justification for doing so, began requiring uh, charities, if they were going to actually operate as charities in California, required them to turn over uh, confidential sections of their, their uh uh, uh, IRS Form 990, what's called the Schedule B. It's an area where you're required as a 501c3 to, uh, it's not part of your public filing, it's, it is a private filing. If the IRS actually discloses information on this form, it's a felony. Um, but they, when they don't prosecute it. Well, there is that. Uh, it's still a felony. <laughs> um, but they require them to turn that information over uh, to the state of California. At, and there was very little uh, 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 assurances that that information was going to be kept in confidence, that it couldn't actually be FOIA'd, for instance, under state law as a record. Uh, and so once you did this, potentially this, is, this could just be posted up on the Internet. And in fact, in some cases, it was. Um, and so our good friends at the Center for Competitive Politics brought a lawsuit against that. The Buckeye Institute was pleased to be able to join in as, as a friend of the court in that matter. Uh, the case went up to this. Uh, ultimately, was, we asked the Supreme Court uh, with CCP to hear the case, and the Supreme Court denied, that, denied hearing that case. Um, Perhaps an even more egregious case, another, uh, another fine effort by uh, the Center for Competitive Politics came out of Delaware. And this should worry every organization in this room uh, because Delaware's law states essentially that if you publish something within so many weeks of an election and it happens to mention someone who's running for office in Delaware, uh, then you have to actually at that point disclose every donor that you have who's given more than $100 cumulatively over the past four years. Uh, so to give you some idea, in this case, they, the, the group that sued published a nonpartisan voter guide. They weren't engaged in electioneering activity. This was simply, you know, what's, what's the voting records? But let me give you a hypothetical. Let's say, for instance, that the Buckeye Institute decided that in Ohio we wanted to mimic some of the good corporate law that they have in Delaware and that we published a study on that and posted it on the internet and in a footnote we happened to mention that there was an amendment made to, Ohio, to Delaware's law sponsored by Senator X. If Senator X is on the ballot and that is on the internet within so many weeks of the election then technically under Delaware's law we would have to reveal every virtually every donor we have, um, despite the fact that we don't even really operate in Delaware. Um, this is remarkably chilling. Again, this case uh, 
the, the challenge was unsuccessful to this law. Uh, uh, CCP asked the Supreme Court to hear it. We joined with, with them uh, in a front of the court brief, asking the court to hear it, and they denied hearing in that case. So uh, again, these these are are very chilling examples of what what you're facing, and there's there are measures on the ballot uh, this November. Uh, if any of you are in South Dak uh, hail from South Dakota or anyone from South Dakota is watching, you have Measure 22, which would force nonprofits to report the names and addresses of their donors uh, to the state government, uh, and bills like that are pending in multiple states. So uh, I, I'm sure I've gone way over time, but the last thing I just wanted to talk about as well is how it is that the left is using the courts to attempt to get donor information. Many of you are familiar with the, uh, with the lawsuit that was brought and the subpoenas uh, that were issued against the Competitive Enterprise Institute, uh, in that case by the first by the Attorney General of the Virgin Islands and joined by uh, the AG from New York and multiple other states. Um, wearing another hat, I sit on the board of the Free Speech in Science Project, uh, and our organization defends organizations and individuals who are subjected to these sorts of spurious attacks. In that case, the, the subpoenas sought information, including information about donors to the organization. Um, ultimately, because of our efforts, the uh, AG for the Virgin Islands was forced to withdraw his subpoena. Uh, and at this point, well, CEI is uh, bringing actions, in fact, against the attorneys who brought the case uh, because of their, their uh, ma functional malpractice. So my, uh, in conclusion, my message is we need to fight. Um, Buckeye is bigger and stronger than it was when we were audited, and it's because of the bravery of supporters who recognized that they should not and cannot be silenced. Uh, and they continued to support us and to support our work and to support our work pushing back against this kind of uh, speech suppressive activities, both by, by the IRS and by states. And CEI subpoena did not just go away. It's because CEI took an aggressive stance. They fought back uh, in, the, in the courts and they fought back in the courts of public opinion. Uh, if we are going to have these rights going forward, we're going to have to fight for them. John? Oh, I'm next. I'm next. I thought Christina was next. I got backwards. So I'm going to talk about one of the other clauses in the First Amendment that seems to be under on the chopping block as well, and that's the right to the free exercise of religion. Uh, Justice Scalia, some 20 years ago, reminded us how difficult this subject is. Uh, and it's gotten, as government expands the space left for religious liberty, um, uh, or at least the space that religious liberty used to occupy has uh, uh, contracted, or the conflicts between the two have gotten increased. Justice Scalia said, way back in Lee versus Weissman, one of my favorite quotes of his, church and state would not be such a difficult subject if religion were, as the court apparently thinks it to be, some pure, some purely personal avocation that can be indulged entirely in secret, like pornography and the privacy of one's home. <laughs> For most believers, it is not that, and it never was. Uh, now, where are we seeing this conflict increasingly? Well, Justice Scalia, also in Employment Division versus Smith, said, look, um, uh, the fact that you can have a generally applicable law substantially burden religion um, and that that might uh, work a, a, a harm, to, particularly to minority religions, uh, he said that's just an unavoidable consequence of demo democratic government. Um, now, I want you to note how that's turned the notion that the free exercise of religion, the freedom of conscience, the right we owe to a higher authority even than government, even than the IRS, um, that's inherent in our Declaration of Independence, how that turns it upside down, that we now only have our right to religious liberty by virtue of a gift of government, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, that instores this higher uh, threshold on protecting religious liberty. And even that is uh, grossly weakened. But the problem is even worse. Uh, it's not limited uh, to minority or small religions. Justice Scalia thought that majority religions would at least be able to be secure, they could get the political will mustered to accommodate uh, themselves from the political process. 
Tell that to the churches up in Massachusetts that are dealing with the new gender identity law. Uh, tell that to the California Christian colleges that just had to beat back SB 1146 a bit, uh, which would have basically prohibited them from adhering to their religious faith in how they conduct their schools. Uh, uh, and it's not just that, though. That's not the worst of it. We are increasingly seeing these, uh, these uh, kinds of mandates um, uh, against religious liberty, against you living out your faith, imposed as the result of collusive sue and settle suits uh, or bureaucratic reinterpretation of the law. And I want to give a couple of examples here that I think are particularly germane. Uh, Hobby Lobby and the Little Sisters cases, we focused extensively in those cases on whether they were protected by the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, but but the, 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 the cases were triggered by bureaucratic rewriting of the statute. Uh, Senator Barbara Mikulski had proposed an amendment to the Affordable Care Act that would require insurance companies and employers to provide no cost preventive care and she lists a litany of things like breast cancer screenings and whatever that are particularly uh, death-causing diseases for women that we had to protect. And somebody, uh, somebody said, this is going to lead to the coverage of abortion and contraceptive coverage. And she went onto the floor of the Senate, said, there are damn lies being told about what my amendment would do. Stop with the lies. It's got nothing to do with abortion and contraceptives. And what happens when it gets over to the agencies? Right? They rewrite preventative care to be anything that's beneficial care, right? and then they list all the beneficial care as anything that, that in their view, advances you know, uh, uh, good medicine, including contraceptive and abortifacients, right? doing the very thing that she said was a damn lie that this statute was going to do. They rework this you know, in violation of the Administrative Procedures Act, no notice and comment, uh, all of this stuff, and then this is what triggers the Affordable Care Act case. We're now living through an even more egregious rewriting of the law in the Title IX regulations that are posing a direct threat to people's religious liberty, to continue to adhere to the view, I mean, it's not just religious liberty, it's liberty generally, it's common sense gen liberty, all right, that men and women are actually, you know, we know what that is, all right, uh, it's become very confused, but in the Title IX, let me just explain here, what the Title IX regulations, Title IX adopted in 1972, here's the statutory language. No person shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in uh, any activity, educational program that receives federal funding. There's a specific exemption from Title IX's uh, prohibition on sex discrimination for uh, that schools and educational facilities are allowed to have sex segregated living facilities. At the time, that, uh, that statute is implemented by a regulation that says, and the living facilities includes bathrooms and showers and other intimate facilities that, uh, uh, that men and women can have separate without violating Title IX. Well, what happens um, when I now say sex means gender identity, uh, and there's an acting, an act, this is a high profile, high level guy, Senate confirmation, all that stuff, not, acting deputy assistant secretary, James Ferg Kadama. All right, and he takes that statutory language, and he takes the regs, and he says, well, uh, EEOC and Department of Justice have recently reinterpreted sex to include gender identity. And then the Office of Civil Rights uh, at the Department of Education and the uh, uh, Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice launched investigations against Arcadia and Downey School Districts in California uh, on complaints that they had uh, conducted gender discrimination because they didn't let a girl uh, uh, go on an overnight camp out and stay in the boys' cabin, and they didn't let a boy shower with the girls in the, in the school showers. Uh, and those two school districts voluntarily entered into an agreement mandating not just a change for that individual student, but a change forevermore in district policy that they would no longer block boys from going into the girl's shower if the boy claimed to be a girl. All right? and, and that's the footnote that, that uh, acting Deputy Assistant Secretary James Ferg Kadama relies on to say, well, the, the administration's position is now vindicated by litigation because we've got this litigation settlement document that's entered into that requires school districts all over the country, including in religious school districts where this is anathema to their religious faith, um, to, to, uh, to accept this kind of uh, transformation of the language. Uh, and it's not done by a change in the statute. It's not done by a change in the regulations going through the Administrative Procedures Act and rule, rule and notice comment making. In fact, I dare say if you had tried to make this change through any legislature, that 
that legislature, it would have never seen the light of day. Even the change to include gender, excuse me, sexual orientation discrimination in Title VII and Title IX has failed for decades. All right, and the notion that these kind of things would ever get through a publicly accountable Congress, who's, I remind people, Article I, Section 1, Clause 1, Sentence 1 of the Constitution, says all the lawmaking powers here and granted are vested in Congress. There's a reason for that, because Congress that has to face the wrath of voters would never remotely have done this kind of nonsense, and yet now it is being imposed by bureaucratic mandate. Um, that case is pending before the Supreme Court, but who in heaven's name knows what that court is going to do with this when it gets up there. Uh, so, so we talk about free speech violations. This, this notion that, that we, we no longer have control of our government to protect, um, I think, gives lie to the notion that religious liberty can be protected, uh, certainly for the mainstream religions, uh, by political accommodation, when there's no political accountability for the things that are being dri uh, done that, that are pose serious threats, not just to religious liberty, but to liberty more broadly. Uh, it seems to me we've got to push back against this. Not just, not just the bureaucrat. The notion, we can't even live under a rule of law if the words mean exactly the opposite of what they mean. Uh, and, and, you know, and, 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 and this this is the kind of nonsense we're dealing with, and it's being imposed by people as high-ranking as assistant acting deputy secretaries in this country. Am I going to get audited for being here? I'm a little worried about today's. Uh, almost every day we hear another story about uh, campus intolerance. I just read about a Columbia University young man, Ben Sweetwood, who had been summoned to the school's Office of Gender-Based Misconduct. <laughs> what had been done? Um, an anonymous informant in his Chinese class took exception to a little joke he made. And uh, the joke was this, uh, he had, he, it was Chinese, he had to use the word handsome in a sentence, and he called himself handsome to the, to the teacher. Uh, the informant uh, sensed some kind of sexist microaggression, he was a white male, he was speaking to a woman of color, a, a woman, a person of color, double jeopardy, in the <laughs> matrix of oppression, bam, reported. Um, he, he received a note from the dean, and then he said, wait, I just called myself handsome. I mean, by the way, Ben is not classically handsome. It was obviously a joke <laughs> on his part. Um, but no, it, no matter what it was, it, it's That's so... Like an aggressive <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've, I've shamed him. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, he had to... The dean quarreled with him, and he said, no, I'm not going to stop doing this, and what are you talking about? And the dean sensed a problematic student, and referred him, gave him a, a, a case officer from the Office of Gender-Based Misconduct. He sees, the gender, he sees this, this officer, and he says, I can't take this seriously. And the uh, officer said, well, I can't take it seriously either. It is kind of ridiculous. But then he said, and even if I were to agree with you, you know I can't say anything. So there's this sort of climate of madness. Um, I encounter this all the time. I'm a frequent college lecturer. I have been lecturing for years. I am not a rabble rouser. Typically, my campuses would uh, attract philosophy students, philosophy professors, some women's studies students. We'd debate, we'd, we'd disagree. Sometimes we'd go out for drinks. It was all very decorous. This changed dramatically in the last few years because I have questioned some of the sacred teachings of what's called intersectional feminism. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, I am regarded as a, a heretic and a dangerous person who will induce PTSD in, in triggered students. I spoke at Oberlin College. I know I was uh, courting danger going there, but I, the, the students at Oberlin and Georgetown at UMass Amherst, they all acted out in, in unusual ways. While I was speaking at UMass Amherst, this young woman the whole time was screeching, F you, F you. She just wanted me to be silent. And the campus uh, authorities, you know, I mean, there were police there, but they didn't intervene. Uh, and, and they, later a professor at Oberlin, at Oberlin they were carrying on. They wanted me not to be invited, and they wanted to dis disinvite me and so forth. And I was accused of discursive violence 
so by one of the professors. And 30, 30 women and a therapy dog were apparently triggered, <laughs> <laughs> triggered by my lecture and rushed off to a, a safe, safe room. <laughs> the other thing is that at Oberlin and uh, just last week, at, uh, I spoke at Cal State LA, and um, there was a massive police presence for my talk. There was even, a, a, as I approached the uh, auditorium, we had to take a back entrance. They were afraid of protesters. And there was a, a whole police detail and an, emer and, and a, uh, an ambulance. <laughs> and I, I, why, what have I come to? <laughs> um, a lot of it is funny. It's just, you know, shenanigans. Uh, but it's, it's, it's actually horrible. And I'll just give you an example. I, when I was speaking at uh, Cal State LA, I also spoke at Claremont. And last year, D, there was a dean there, Mary Spellman, who uh, had resigned after protests. Now, she was a, a very well-meaning woman, and, but she sent a poorly worded email to a student. A, a Latina student had protested uh, in the school newspaper about how isolated she felt and she didn't fit in. And, and as a gesture of kindness, the dean sent a letter saying that she'd like to help her and she wants to work to serve those who don't fit our, uh, our uh, Claremont McKenna mold. Don't fit the Claremont McKenna mold? They, now, of course, she meant that, ironically, she doesn't approve of that. No, but she said it. They, they willfully misinterpreted it. And there's a scene, you can, I don't advise you to look at it, but you can look at it. It's on YouTube where she's sort of surrounded She's apologizing. She's crying. It's a Chinese struggle session in the Cultural Revolution. I mean, she's not going to be thrown out the window, but she, gets, she loses her job. Two, two Hispanic students went on a hunger strike. I mean, the overreaction to, to something like it's so ridiculous, but she, she loses her job. And I just wondered, I mentioned this while I was at Claremont, and there was an older professor there, and he came up and he said, well, I'm glad you mentioned her. She was in her 50s. She had a small house in Claremont. This, is, this was her whole life. And I said, where is she now? And he said, no, you know, he didn't know. And no one cared to look into it. But this, this movement, this hysterically intolerant movement, it, it, the, these, it's uh, intensifying. Now, again, people look for explanations about how we raised the, the millennials. Were they too helicoptered? Or, this or that. I, I think that that uh, is missing out on the, the source of what's going on because the recent assault on free speech, on due process, on academic freedom, on common sense on campus has a theory behind it. It has a self-confident theory that has been elaborately worked out and developed by scholars in departments such as gender and ethnic studies, as well as anthropology, sociology, and schools of education. And it's called intersectionality. And if you don't know about it, you should. Because it probably, I don't think a college student could escape a course that didn't take an intersectional approach. It's certainly not in the humanities and social sciences. Um, according to this theory, it was first developed in the 70s and 80s by a group of um, African-American feminists who actually had a reasonable complaint against the, women's, the, the, the national women's movement. They felt they weren't reflected in the, in the program. But it turned into a, what was initially um, a demand, a request, for various movements as well as uh, the social sciences to be more aware of marginalized identities, diverse identities, it's turned into a full-scale, unified th theory of reality. It comes with a, a political theory. It comes with a theory of knowledge. Um, now, as it's learned in, I would think, almost every gender studies, women's studies class, um, the young women sit there and some young men, and they learn that uh, society is made up of um, these complex, overlapping uh, there are these complex overlapping pathologies. They're not separate. So racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, they're not discrete. They overlap and they reinforce each other, creating, in some people, m multiple uh, disadvantage and others, pure privilege. And of course, it's the white, able-bodied, cisgendered male that's on top and then 
it goes down. And, and the, the, the identities keep multiplying. It's, it's not even clear what they mean by these identities, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, so take someone like Patricia Hill Collins. She is a professor of, uh, in the sociology department at the University of Maryland. She was former president of the American Sociological Association, and she's a, one of the chief architects of this theory. So I'll just cite her textbook. I could cite many such texts, but uh, in this textbook on race and gender, uh, it's in its ninth edition and very popular, uh, she describes the United States not as the land of the free, but rather this a matrix of oppression. And she says that there's sort of a veneer of freedom and opportunity, but underlying that is a rigid system of privilege and domination. Further, she alerts students to the true nature of their society, and she says, dominant forms of knowledge have been constructed largely from the experiences of the most powerful. That's a quote from the text. Uh, so this textbooks and others like it, entire programs, promise students that they will bring them in touch with deeper, subordinated truths. That's a phrase from Michel Foucault subordinated truths uh, by avoiding what they call Western and masculine ways of knowing. So according to these theories, and this is very important to understand what's happened on the campus, subjugated groups, women, people of color, disabled, having been subjugated, you have access to privileged knowledge, deeper, more liberating, authentic knowledge about human reality that's been kept from you. And, uh, but you can only discover this knowledge by speaking out in a safe space where you feel protected. Uh, and to provide that safety, members of the privileged groups, especially white, able-bodied, normal, you know, heteronormative males, they should just be quiet and listen. And if they try to apply reason or logic to the positions of the marginalized, uh, to, a marginally, you know, to a marginalized and intersectionally oppressed persons, they will be told to stop mansplaining, and of course to check their privilege, and regardless of the merits of what, what this person is saying. Now, unlike classical liberalism or the equity feminism that I very much believe in, intersectional theory did not develop from the European Enlightenment. It grew out of the radical politics of the 1960s, and it's informed by the philosophy of Karl Marx and his modern day heirs, Paulo Freire, Franz Fanon, Michel Foucault, and so on. So traditional, our views, most of us would think American ideals of, you know, we hold dear free expression and due process, the right to pursue happiness, and, uh, you know, individual freedom. These are seen as working as ploys for privileged classes to maintain dominance. Now, I and I, I think most Americans, probably most people in this room see the United States as a, a flawed, deeply flawed, but highly successful diverse society. Maybe the most diverse and successful the world has ever seen. Intersectional theory sees something different. Uh, Bell Hooks, who is probably the, one of the best known intersectional theorists, she routinely uh, re refers to the United States as imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. And then she describes the interlocking political system that is the foundation of our national life, according to her. Now, this theory is a confused mess. It fights racism and sexism by classifying everybody by race and sex. Uh, it's predicated on this false proposition that the United States is an imperialist, white supremacist patriarchy. Again, I mean, ridiculous to overstatement. Uh, and compared to what and to who and what are they talking about? Uh, as it is practiced on campus, it is f it's fostering tribalism and, and bullying because it tells white males they have to check their privilege and then every, everyone else uh, can treat them badly. Because, and so we see this, we've seen, we've seen horrible uh, mistreatment of people. And, and I would cite that woman, uh, Mary Spellman at, at uh, Claremont College, is just an example, is that it licenses the cruelty as well as you know, just a grotesque violation of, of rights. It, it's spreading, it's, uh, and, and I speak as a uh, white, cisgendered, age-enhanced female. Uh, now, you would think that as a multiply marginalized person that I, I have access to this deep 
truths and knowledge. And I just spoke, as I said, at California State, uh, in, at, at California State University in LA, uh, to, and it was the Young Americans, uh, Young America's Foundation that brought me in. So it was a conservative and libertarian students. They were, there were 40 of them. They were almost all persons of color. Uh, I think there was only one uh, person of full privilege uh, uh, in the <laughs> But, uh, but, they, but they, 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 uh, their opponents on campus tore down posters announcing my talk. They heard I was going to be critical of intersectional theory. Uh, and that was destabilizing for their point of view and the opposite of what the teachers are trying to do. But anyway, I am here to tell you that our traditions of liberty are in serious danger. Intersectional theory may be a confused muddle, but it has power. It has tenure. And there's no signs that it's going away anytime soon. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we, we did start uh, 10 minutes late, so I think we have another five minutes to, uh, uh, for questions to the audience, just one or, one or two. And if you would, wait till the microphone comes around and uh, please identify yourself and please ask a question, uh, not, not a speech. Uh, yes, ma'am, right here in the front. Hi, Penny Starr with CNS News. Well, you've laid out a lot of very scary things. But one of the things you said, Mr. Alt, is we have to fight. I take that as sort of the takeaway of what you're all talking about. But can you give us any specifics on how that's to be done, um, both as individuals or as a country or as Congress? Thank you. Well, I'll, I can give you a couple of things. Number one, I think a candidate for president who stands up and says, in, in response to a question about tell us what you're thinking about in terms of a Supreme Court justice and the first and never mentions the Constitution and says um, that she wants to repeal Citizens United and and walk through the litany of things that would further uh, infringe upon our free speech rights I don't care if she's running against I don't care who she's running against I'm voting for him <laughs> Because I think that that is vital. And it is too bad that we have reached a point in our country where one person on the United States Supreme Court can so impact our First Amendment, our constitutional rights. But that's where we are. And I think that that is the most vital thing we can do if we care about the First Amendment the Second Amendment, and all the other amendments of our, to our Constitution. And the Third. I'm becoming increasingly concerned about the Third Amendment. Look, um, uh, we also have control of the Congress. Um, uh, when, when the Schedule B donor list of the National Organization for Marriage was inadvertently released, now this is, this is the most highly sought after donor list so that we could you know, threaten and cajole people away from supporting traditional marriage in the country. And the gal that was pegged with having done this inadvertent release, some low level clerk out in Utah whose only job is to make sure when they get requests for the 990s that they go out without that Schedule B. And the only time she has ever failed in that job in her 20 year history at the IRS was on the most hotly contested Schedule B. <laughs> All right, and we're supposed to believe this BS coming out of the IRS. Well, well, we couldn't do anything about it because the guy that got the donor list claimed the Fifth Amendment immunity. All right, that meant that he knew he was engaged in criminal conduct, that it was not an inadvertent release. All right, does the Department of Justice give him uh, immunity to testify? No. Does our Congress call him up with a subpoena to say, we're going to give you the immunity and force you to testify on who gave you that list? No. All right, so one of the problems is we're not using the powers we have to fight back on this. And doggone it, those guys have to be held to account to make sure they're using the powers they have to protect the liberties of the citizenry. All right, we just had. All right, I'm sorry, we've only got time for one more question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Got here, we got the microphone coming right here. This has been so interesting and so important that I have a question, but it's for the audience. Is there anyone here from the Washington Post? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think there is. Uh, but on, on that, I'm sorry, on that note, we're going to have to end because we're out of time. So thank, th another thanks for our panel, please. <laughs>